Hey, what's up guys? In this video, we will be talking about GLP-1 agonists such as Ozempic and Monjaro and their link to vision loss or a condition specifically known as non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So let's get started. So what is non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or NION for short? It's a medical condition characterized by sudden painless vision loss in one or both eyes due to insufficient blood flow to the optic nerve. This lack of blood supply leads to damage of the optic nerve fibers, resulting in vision impairment. It can be either gradual, which most people experience, or it can be a sudden onset. The problem with NION is that the exact mechanism of what causes it is still unknown. And that's what makes it kind of challenging. It really is almost like a diagnosis of exclusion. So there have been multiple studies in the past that have tried to narrow down the exact causes of this. What they relate most of the causes to is rapid correction of hyperglycemia. There was a previous study that showed that rapid correction of hyperglycemia can lead to retinopathy, but you know it's still unsure of exactly what the exact mechanism that causes that is. So one working theory is that when you have such a high blood glucose level and you rapidly correct it, that causes like an inflammatory process or it's kind of like a shock to the body. And that causes like sudden proliferation or growth of new blood vessels to that area. Usually you would think new blood vessels to an area is good, right? More blood flow, more blood supply. However, the optic disc and optic nerve have only like a limited amount of surface area. So if you crowd it with so many blood vessels, it actually can become damaging and just crowd the optic nerve and optic discs, almost kind of like suffocating it. Another working theory has to do with osmotic gradients or fluid shifts. So I wanna preface this by saying that water likes to go from an area that has a low concentration of solute or you know of a substance to an area that has a high concentration of something. In this instance, we're talking about sugar. So in type two diabetics and people with prediabetes or insulin resistance, their blood has a lot of sugar that's floating around compared to the optic disc or surrounding anatomy. When you rapidly correct that, the concentration of sugar in the blood lowers, which causes the concentration of sugar in the optic nerve or optic disc to be significantly higher than it previously was. And then this causes a rapid shift of fluid into the optic nerve, into the optic disc, and this can cause it to bulge, um, swell up, and can cause visual issues. Another working theory has to deal with the constant stimulation of GLP-1 receptors. So as we've mentioned before, there are GLP-1 receptors in the brain, uh, in the gut, in the stomach, and you know pancreas, but there are also GLP-1 receptors on the optic nerve and the optic disc. And it's unclear what constant stimulation and activation of these receptors, how that affects vision, and you know what the long-term effects are. All right, so we are gonna be talking about one of the most popular study that came out regarding semaglutide and nion. And this was the study that was conducted in Denmark. It consisted of 424,152 participants, which actually happens to be the entire population of Denmark that was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes by December 1st of 2018. And it's weird, right? It's When you think about it, it's like, how can you have such a large sample size in a study? And it's because of the type of study this is. So when you look at medical data, it's important to understand what type of study you're looking at. This study is what we call a retrospective study. And basically what that means is that researchers and analysts are looking at people that were diagnosed with, let's say in this case, NION, and looking back at what sort of previous exposure happened that they could say caused this increase in NION diagnoses. Whereas the studies I think that are most successful and can show a clear cause and effect are ones that are what we call double blind, which means you, when you have participants in a study, you give half of them drug X, you give half of them nothing or a placebo, and you see which ones develop nion or you know pathology X. And that way you can show a direct cause and effect. Whereas when you look at retrospective studies, because there are so many other factors that can affect it, it's hard to show an exact cause and effect. But this happened to be a retrospective study um, and the average population were males that were 65 years old, had diabetes for at least three years, and had an A1C of at least 6.5. The exclusion criteria were they had to be older than 18, no history of nion in the past, and they were not on any sort of other GLP-1 agonist, whether it was oral or injectable. The exposed group, or the people that had a prescription for semaglutide were 106,454. Non-exposed was 317,698. So almost triple that of the people that had semaglutide. So what they did was they looked at the uh, number of first time nion diagnoses over certain periods of time. So they basically looked at the first number of nion events between 2003 and 2023. 
and it actually showed that the highest number of first time NIAN events happened between 2019 and 2023. And why is that important? It's important because those were the years when semaglutide was fully available on the market and openly prescribed. So that was one point that made them concerned. They also looked at the annual number of first time NIAN episodes before semaglutide was on the market to when it was on the market. So between 2003 to 2018, the annual number of first time NIAN episodes was 67. From 2019 to 2023, the number of first time NIAN episodes was 148, almost double of what it was previously. So what does this mean? Like I said, with a study like this, it's hard to show a direct cause and effect, but it does show a relationship between ozempic or semaglutide and nion and it shows that semaglutide has a 2.19 fold increase in risk to develop nion versus people who weren't on semaglutide or didn't have any exposure to it so it does show that there is a relationship between nion and semaglutide an interesting thing also is that they looked at the time frame from when people who developed nion were first prescribed semaglutide to when they eventually were diagnosed with the condition. And it showed that it took an average of 22.2 months before they were diagnosed or before they started seeing symptoms of the condition. So, you know, ultimately, I personally believe the study showed that there is a direct relationship between ozempic and nion. I do think ozempic may increase the risk of nion. Showing a cause and effect is not possible with this study. I think there needs to be more studies done down the line. So what was wrong with the study that I think makes it hard to extrapolate an exact cause and effect? And it has to do with a few things. One I told you was a retrospective study. So it was hard to control the other variables that might be going on with patients, such as like lifestyle or other medications they may be on. There are some medications such as like, you know, chemo drugs or other antihypertensives, medications for blood pressure that can also increase your risk of having visual visual changes or optic nerve damage. So it's hard to rule out those other underlying factors because it was a retrospective study. They just look back on data. They didn't make sure that patients were on anything else other than semaglutide. Also, the study was a registry-based study. So basically, they didn't have access to the ophthalmic examination done by the ophthalmologist, but they basically just went off of diagnosis code. So they saw if the insurance company or somebody billed the diagnosis, Nyon, and then they marked that on a patient that might have used semaglutide or didn't use semaglutide. So my problem with that is that the pathophysiology of Nyon is so poorly understood that it's often a diagnosis of exclusion. So patients may be diagnosed with Nyon without actually truly having it. They just don't have any other diagnosis or the ophthalmologist can't put them into another category of disease. So they say, hey, it's Nyon. And you know, that's not fair because if they fell into that category and they use semaglutide, you're associating the two without a direct cause and effect. Also, another thing that the study showed was that the number of diagnoses of type 2 diabetes among patients with newly diagnosed Nyon increased from 4% in 2003 to 2018 to 24.7% in 2019 to 2023. So there was a fourfold increase in the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, but they did not take that into consideration when they're saying that the number of Nyon incidents also increased. So is there truly a relationship between type 2 diabetes and Nyon? or is it semaglutide? This study doesn't let us really break it down and you know differentiate between the two. So what does this mean for you going forward? The pathophysiology of Nyon is poorly understood, but we know that high blood sugar, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure can all lead to retinopathy and optic nerve damage. So in my opinion, the benefits that GLP-1 agonists have on your metabolic health outweigh the risks of Nyon, especially since this study did show that there is a relationship, but it did not show a direct cause and effect. However, I will say that if you have underlying retinopathy or optic nerve damage and visual issues, you should consult with your primary care provider or ophthalmologist before starting a GLP-1 agonist or while you are on a GLP-1 agonist. That way you can have frequent monitoring to you know, assess and monitor any sort of visual issues or anatomical changes and pathologies that may come up to try and prevent or stop the GLP-1 agonist before um, some long-term and permanent effect may occur. So if you do have any questions, please leave a comment below. You can shoot me an email. Um, I eventually plan on getting a website set up. Just been so busy with hospital life. If you did find this video helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys later. Thanks.